If you've been in the reptile keeping hobby for more than any time whatsoever, you've probably dreamed of having the most elaborate, incredible setup possible for the animal that you're keeping. While that's nice, more selfishly, you can also think of the beautiful display that it will make in your home instead of having a lame DVD case or something like that. A beautiful vivarium would work much better. As you guys might know, dart frog keeping is one of my favorite parts of this hobby. I used to have tens to twenties, now I'm down to only like ten. What's up guys, my name is Mike with Alpha Reptile. In this video, it is going to be a bit of a special one. This is actually for a school project, so I hope you guys understand. My goal for this video is to give you some general information on one of the most quintessential parts of keeping dart frogs, specifically in the genus Ufaga, which is the egg eating. That's what it stands for, or that's what the Latin translation is. And that quintessential part is going to be nutrient uptake in bromeliads, Dispelling some myths about roots versus no roots, that kind of thing. So if you're interested, make sure you stick around and watch the whole video. Before I get into the heart of nutrient uptake in bromeliads, I just wanted to give you guys some general information on bromeliads. Uh, so those of you that are beginning kind of have a little bit of a foothold to stand on when we're going to be a little bit more scientific later on in the video. Bromeliads are found all across the Neotropics, so they are found in southern Mexico, most of Mexico to be honest. Uh, they are also found throughout Mezzo and South America. Now they have been imported to places like Florida and more tropical places in the states. They do fine there, but that's just not where they're endemic to. There is a ton of different species of bromeliads. All in total, there's about 3,000 individual species, and the cultivars, or the man-made versions, there's tens of thousands available on the market now. In this video, and primarily in the, in the horticulture and dart frog hobby, there's two different kinds of bromeliads, or two different like growth styles of bromeliads. There's the terrestrial ones, like you can see on screen right now, those guys tend to be massive, and they are technically in the family of bromeliads. That's not going to be the focus of this video. The primary focus of this video is going to be the epiphytic ones, which means they grow on surfaces, uh, not in a standard soil mixture, or not terrestrially on the ground. A little fun fact before we get into the nutrient uptake. Did you know there's myrmycophytic bromeliads? Some of you guys might be sitting there like, what does that even mean? And I'm here to tell you. Basically what that means is the bromeliads form a mutualistic relationship with ants. Researchers have shown that this mutualistic relationship is positive for both the ants and the plant, otherwise it wouldn't be mutualistic. Um, for the ants, they are essentially attracting other invertebrates to the bromeliads, which help break down nutrients and overall increase the nutrient uptake of the plants. What do the plants do for the ants though? As you may or may not have guessed, the plants provide the ants with some shelter as well as uh, an easy food source because a lot does end up washing into the bromeliad. Okay, okay, so now that you guys have a background in the whole uh, diversity of bromeliads and now know a cool fact to share at the dinner table with your family, why don't we get to the root of the issue? and talk about the role of roots in bromeliads. There's a couple different thought processes. Some people think that they are just like most roots for other plants and uptake nutrients and water and uh, help the plant anchor into the soil. The real version and the uh, version that is a little bit less known is that bromeliad roots really serve no function other than to anchor the plant to, in our case, the tops of trees or in rock crevices. Areas where soil is really not existent. The anchoring nature of bromeliad roots is kind of seen universally, but a lot of people do think that they take up nutrients, which is not true. The vast majority of epiphytic bromeliads do not use their roots as a water and nutrient uptake. However, of course, because this is the world and science, there is an exception to that rule. A study in 2005, and there hasn't really been any follow-up since then, showed that there is actually a fungal association found in one species of bromeliad that they tested. If you guys are familiar with gardening or anything like that, you might have heard the term mycorrhiza. Now what a mycorrhiza is, is the association between a plant and a fungus. So that association together 
is a mycorrhiza. This fungal association or mycorrhiza is actually super beneficial to the plant because what it allows it to do is increase water management, increase nutrient uptake, as well as there's evidence for pest and pathogen protection from the fungus. Now how is this possible? Essentially the fungus will spread through many different roots of different trees and different plants. Now how does the association benefit another plant? Essentially, it's called a common mycorrhizal network or a shared mycorrhizal network. What that essentially means is that the fungus connects to several different plants and kind of daisy chains it. It allows the nutrients to be passed from one plant to another to another. It's basically just sharing nutrients from one plant to another. And now, like I said, I don't want to go out now and say, oh no, the bromeliad roots really do have a function. They actually do uptake nutrients because that's not necessarily proven. Uh, when I was doing research, I couldn't find any real more research showing that either mechanisms or that it was truly benefiting the plant. That's just what this one study found in that they found the, it's called an arabuscular mycorrhizae. Uh, that's not important for you guys to know but if you guys want to know, you can Google it. So yeah, I'm not gonna jump to any conclusions and say, oh, no, bromeliad roots do have a function because it was shown in one species of bromeliad and there was like five specimens. That should be used as some information for you guys, the budding scientists out there, uh, to look into it more. If you have or want to do some research, that's certainly something to look into. But now it's time to forget the roots and leaf some room for phytotelmata. Cool word, right? Now you guys might recall me just kind of going off about how the roots don't have any function in the plant. That's because there is a structure in the leaves of the plant called trichomes, which are essentially a uh, cell that brings in water and nutrients into the plant, ergo taking over the role of roots in bromeliads. Now if any of you guys have ever seen a bromeliad, you've probably noticed that you water them from the top, or if you're in the wild, they're filled with a bunch of debris and water. In this phytotelma, or phytotelmata for plural, uh, which literally means plant pond, if you break it up into its Greek origins, this pond or phytotelma or tank is where most of the trichomes are found for bromeliads. They're found throughout the leaves, but there is a concentration of them found in the base of the plants. Now this is especially useful for bromeliads because those leaves kind of act as a channel for any falling debris, um, dead insects, animal waste, rain to pool into the bottom of the plant. So if you're following me right now, you might be wondering how this large organic debris that is now sitting in the base of a plant breaks down to eventually become nutrients and feed the plant? What what kind of wizardry is this? Over time, bromeliads have actually formed a mutualistic relationship. I've used that word once and briefly explained it, but essentially what that means is two organisms coming together and both benefiting from the interaction or process that they are going through together. Now, bromeliads have made a mutualistic relationship with numerous different microorganisms like bacteria and fungi, as I mentioned earlier, as well as numerous different invertebrates. They are all found in the base of the plants and essentially what they do is they take this organic matter, decompose it into its, uh, I guess, original nutrients. So nitrogen, phosphorus, all the micronutrients. Primarily out of all this organic matter, nitrogen will be the main yield. And research has actually shown that this is the primary source of nitrogen for bromeliads is the decomposition of all these different organic matter. Now, okay, great, Mike, you've just told us all this science stuff, but you know what? I'm here for dart frogs, and I don't know why you're talking to me like this. Well, for those of you that have made it this far into the video, I would like to share to you why bromeliads and just kind of knowing this knowledge is cool and also very functional. The phytotoma are extremely important for reptiles and amphibians. As you guys can see, uh, the dart frogs that I currently have lay eggs on the leaves of the bromeliads and then eventually will transport the little tadpoles to live in the phytotoma. In addition to that, reptiles, 
more or less amphibians, will actually retreat to the base of bromeliads or the phytotelma, the little ponds in there, during the heat of the day to avoid desiccation. Basically what desiccation means is drying out. Now as I mentioned earlier, the genus Ufaga or egg eating, bromeliads are really pretty much essential for because what they do is they will lay their eggs on the bromeliad, they'll transport them to the phytotelma, and then the mother will bring and lay eggs in the little phytotelma for the tadpole to consume and grow over time. Eventually, after many months, the tadpole will metamorphose into a little tiny baby dart frog, and even I have the joy of seeing the very first time a little tiny dart frog crawled up the slight incline of the bromeliad leaves and took its first leap into the world. <laughs> it was beautiful. So for those of you that have stuck around for this entire video, I really hope that you guys have taken something from this. It could be something as simple as that bromeliad roots are really nothing more than just anchoring for the plant to its host, I suppose, or location. Or maybe it was as simple as a new cool name for the little uh, area of water at the base of bromeliads, the phytotelma or tank. What all this boils down to in general is that there are a lot more processing going there are a lot more processes going on in nature that humans, that we, the scientific community, is not aware of, and there is still a ton of research to be done when it comes to everything in our natural world, including bromeliads. I hope that your main draw from this video is curiosity. There's ways for you guys to find information online. Google Scholar is one of them. Um, of course, you can always hit up a university. Uh, if you're in high school and you're looking to go for your university, I'm here. You guys can shoot me a message on Instagram or Facebook or even send me an email. All the links are down below. I'll answer any questions that you guys have to the best of my ability, um, whether you have inquiries about university or you're looking to do some research. Um, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And for those of you that are just in the dart frog hobby, and are wondering why I watched this video. I kind of hope that you guys learned some stuff too. The phytotelma is a cool word. I mean, come on, right? It's kind of cool to toss around the dinner table. Um, but in addition to that, I know sometimes or some people in the dart frog hobby tend to rinse out their bromeliad or totally flush all the leaves and that's really not all that beneficial. Um, some people are kind of scared that their, their leaves will be rotting or whatnot. That's a natural process and you really shouldn't try and combat it because if you think about it now, when you're washing out the phytotelma, what you're doing is wiping away all the nutrients that the plants have accumulated. Even in our little dart frog vivariums, there will be microinvertebrates, there will be microorganisms living in the phytotelma and washing them out is just just going to harm your plant, it's not really going to help your plant. I also think I made it pretty obvious on why it's so important to have bromeliads in your vivariums. So if you're setting up really anything, a lot of animals will use it as a water source or um, as a hiding spot. There's a ton of different uses for bromeliads like I mentioned earlier. So I encourage you to add them to your next vivarium. And if you do, I would also appreciate you guys sending me some pictures of your vivariums that you've made uh, after you've watched this video and kind of learned some stuff about placement, i.e. in trees or not in saturated soil for bromeliads. And once you're done with that, you can send me a picture to my Instagram, Facebook, email, whatever you like, uh, and I will uh, look at them, enjoy them, and hope that you guys will continue in the hobby. So I want to thank you all very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, smash that like button. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, leave them in the comment section as I do reply to every comment. If you guys want to see more kind of educational videos like this, definitely let me know. This was a school project, so uh, hi Dr. Addy. Uh, <laughs> I hope you made it to the very end of this video. Thanks for watching everybody. We'll catch you in the next video. Later.